Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Change Food Eats. Today's guest is Ebeth Johnson. She is a mindful eating coach and well-life mentor for women who are ready to live their most delicious life. Through her lifestyle brands, Delicious Living and Breastfeeding Chef, she helps women tune into the healing power of mindful meals, empowered movement, loving self-care rituals, and positive mindsets. As a professional chef, plant-based nutritionist, and media personality, Ebeth marries her love of food, cooking, wellness, and mindfulness to encourage and inspire women and their families to incorporate nourishing foods and nurturing lifestyle practices into daily life deliciously and with ease and grace. Welcome to the show, Ebeth. Thank you. Hi. Hi, how are you? Did that work? Did I press all the right buttons? <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know if I did and I don't know why when I look on Facebook it just has you anyway I don't know what oh. I'm doing sorry everybody um it's okay even if this live recording doesn't go so well I actually remembered no I didn't to press record yeah I, I don't see record. it on my screen but you'll probably see it on yours well it says live on Facebook and then yeah on mine it says that I'm recording so okay, which is cool. the first, I forgot the other two times, but I've done that too. <laughs> and even if we don't, it records on Facebook, so we're all good. Okay, cool. okay so I'm so excited. So just every, so everyone knows, Eveth and I have known each other for quite a long time and haven't had yes. time to catch up. So there might be a little, it might be a little catch up. Yeah. I don't believe in gossip, but catch up. So tell me, <laughs> how are you doing and how have you been dealing with COVID? I am doing really well, I have to say. Uh, overall, COVID is definitely a challenge. Um, it has challenged me to really deepen into the practices I talk about in Delicious Living, I would have to say, in a different way when I'm just stuck at home, I'm not going out, spending so much time with my child and my husband and myself. So it's been a learning experience. It's been a growing experience. It's also been challenging. I agree with Michelle Obama. I've experienced some low grade depression moments <laughs> for sure. Oh, but um, I'm yeah, also... I can't, I can't begin to tell you like here in New York city, March, April were really bad and I didn't mm. do too well. Yeah. 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 I feel more at this point, I mostly feel enraged about things that I see in my neighborhood. Sometimes I've, I, I haven't posted about it much, but I did the other day and I just thought, what are y'all doing at these restaurants? No masks, no distancing, no care in the world. I was just, so that drives me a little bit crazy, but um, well, I've learned I'm my... more of a homebody too. So where are you? You're in DC, right? I'm in DC. Yep. So this is my take and this might be controversial, but love it. Outdoors, from what I understand, the um, possibility of getting it is very slim so I don't have a problem with two people at a distance table when you have 12 people spinning on top of each other even outdoors I have some issues because here in New York because I'm in New York City they put canopies over it and they have like fencing bamboo fencing around it's like well then that's sort of defeating the point of being in open air but uh, uh -huh. I do think if you're six feet away like walking down the street I have a foster I take him I take her for a walk. If no one's around, I take my mask down. If someone's coming, I put my mask up. I don't think we have to be constantly plastered in a mask, but yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I would probably agree with you more if I was in a different space. I think the reason why for me personally, I'm so kind of hypervigilant is because I have two high risk people in my family. My son oh. has asthma and my husband has lung cancer. So, Ooh. you know, for me, I you know, I may be seeing it through a slightly different lens than maybe most people. Um, right. But so for me, I'm just like, ah, <laughs> get away from me, all of you, all of you. Yeah. That's how yeah. my no, world the, is right now. <laughs> well, and the homebody thing, I live in the East Village, so I'm downtown on the east side oh, in Manhattan. I have not gone it. midtown in like six months. I have not gone, I just went, no ho, it's like overbroad. It's just a five minute walk. I went over there a couple weeks ago. I'm like, it's a new country. It's insane. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I'm glad yeah. you're okay. Thank um, you. How second, about you? How are you doing? I know you're trying I'm to good. talk to me, but <laughs> you're doing well. <laughs> I'm doing. I'm doing really well, actually. I mean, I 
I, I did a partnership deal to do this new online global community, which I'll tell you more about offline, oh, cool. but yeah. um, it was to do events. It's events and collaboration platform. Whoops. Then COVID hit. Love it. Well, COVID hit. Oh, so well, I am, COVID hit, right. Yeah. But I'm redesigning and I can't talk about it publicly yet, but I'm literally redesigning what a experience is where you don't have to leave your home, but have an actual experience, not a Zoom. <sighs> There's only so much zooming someone can do, you know. Amen, I'm sorry, girl. I know. No, but, I love it. Okay, so the show's yeah. most important question, second most important question is what are you doing? Okay. Oh, well, I know it's lunchtime almost, but I'm actually having a snack. I figured y'all don't really want to see me eat because you know. <laughs> so I have a little snack, one of my favorites. I often recommend this. It's just nuts, cashews, almonds, and some dark chocolate. That's Ooh. it. I'm going to munch on a little, I'm not going to eat this entire bowl. Don't worry, <laughs> but I am going to eat some of it. Yeah. You can eat it all if you want to. I'm okay with that. <laughs> so, yes. So now that you took a mouthful, all right. talk to us about, <laughs> talk to us I'll about too quick. <laughs> oh, just too slow. It's okay. This is supposed to be laid back and fun anyway. So, but tell us about delicious living with Ebeth and the breast breastfeeding chef. Like the, you didn't have these companies last time we talked. So tell me, what are you doing? You know, what's the, mm -hmm. what's the mindset around it and all that? Sure. Um, I'll start with Breastfeeding Chef just because it's August and you may or may not know that August is National Breastfeeding Month and International Breastfeeding Week, I think just finished. But I started Breastfeeding Chef because I was a breastfeeding mom. And it's kind of funny because... I knew even as a pregnant woman that I wanted to breastfeed. I had never seen anyone breastfeed in my life. I realized that afterwards. I didn't know anything about breastfeeding. I took all the classes and all of that and had a great delivery, great birth. And then my son pretty much cried constantly. If he wasn't nursing or sleeping, he was crying. And I tried everything, different diapers, cooler clothes, hotter clothes, different sleep schedules, different soaps, you know, all kinds of things, just trying to figure out what is going on with this kid. And finally, I called my naturopath friend and he said, it's something you're eating. And I said, what are you talking about? I teach other people how to eat. <laughs> you know, I've been eating local, seasonal, fresh. Yeah, I've been cooking at home, organic, all the things. And he says, well, it's something you're eating. You know, it goes into your breast milk. It's affecting cayenne. You got to figure out what it is. Take yourself on as a client, he said. And I was like, okay. I mean, I didn't really believe him because I thought, I know, you know, I know so much about food. I'm eating really well, but I trusted him deeply because he's an incredible healer and I had known him for years. So I did take myself on as a client. I started thinking, if this is in fact a digestive issue, what foods might I need to add or take away? And I played with that and I discovered that Cayenne's issues changed. He stopped having skin issues. He stopped crying as much. He stopped having as much colic and cradle cap, eczema, all of that, just because of some small changes I made to my diet that I had never thought about, even though I spent my life teaching people about my adult life anyway, teaching people about food and eating and wellness. It never really occurred to me a connection between breastfeeding and what I was eating. And no one even presented that to me as an idea as I tried to search for answers. So, um, I decided to share what I had learned with other moms and just see, are you having this experience? Does this help you? Cause it helped me and turned out it wasn't just me. You know, other women were having these challenges. No one was pointing them in the direction of food and the few changes I encouraged um, produced results for them. So that's how that business started. I just started saying, I need to share this information with as many women as possible who might be having similar challenges. So that's how Breastfeeding Chef came along. So is it, general things like everybody needs to cut out I don't know dairy or chocolate no. cut out or different like microbiome is it different for every individual it's more like microbiome it's more like different for everyone there are some things that are consistent like if you have a child with colic and you are a mom who's eating a fair amount of dairy or who eats dairy every day it could be a likely possibility that if we took the dairy out the colic could be improved because that's a very common um, correlation but it's not true for everyone. Everyone's body, everyone's baby is different. So I take a broad stroke look at first, but then I look really specifically at what are you eating and what's happening when you eat those things. 
and make it right. more specific. So that's right. Breastfeeding Chef, which has been amazing. Um, I nursed Cayenne for three years and it was it was just amazing. He's nine and still talks about it. It's a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to uh, us about Delicious Living. Yes, so Delicious Living is more of my umbrella. You could say Breastfeeding Chef kind of goes under that, but Delicious Living is, um, the work that I do with moms and mompreneurs to help them to create a better relationship with food. One that doesn't have anything to do with like the typical things, diets, deprivation, body drama, shaming. I don't wanna have any of that in our food environment or in the way we're thinking about food and movement. So instead I help women to think about food from the space of how do I nourish and nurture my mind, my body, my spirit? How do I fuel my goals, my grit, my greatness? Um, how am I doing that through what I eat, what I think, how I move, and the people I surround myself with? And I, I think it's kind of fun. I came up with an acronym that is my favorite sound, which is mmm, because I mean, <laughs> if I'm eating something delicious, what are we going to say? Mmm. So uh, all of those M's represent the pillars that I use to help move women from this space of diet deprivation, body drama to one of feeding and fueling. And those are meals, mindset, movement, and membership. So who are you with? How are you moving your body? What are you putting in your body as far as food? And what are you thinking? That is so amazing. Okay, Thank so you. <laughs> just to back up a step, why... Why would someone want to hire a wellness coach? Why, what, what do wellness coaches offer that I can't get in a book, let's say? Ooh, good question. Um, well, we can get a lot of things out of books. We can get a lot of information and that can be helpful. But sometimes it's not enough to have information. We have to take action. Sometimes we need support. And sometimes the information that we've read needs to be tailored to our specific body needs and goals mm. so I would say a person would hire a wellness coach who knows that they want to change their relationship with food change the way that they move maybe they have gained weight they want to lose maybe they find that they created a life where they're so busy they don't have they haven't created time and space for food and movement, but they realize that those things are important and they want to do that, but they're not sure how. Mm. Someone who maybe feels like they know what they need to do. Like I have the intellectual knowledge. I should eat more vegetables. I should cook more at home. I should exercise more, but I'm just not doing it. <laughs> I need accountability. I need to start to understand what's getting in my way. What's the block between the knowing and the doing? So a wellness right. coach can really help make those transitions mirror that information to you so that you can see, oh God, I didn't even realize I was doing that or that I was thinking that and then help you to make those transitions. And a book's not going to call you on your stuff right. <laughs> in the same way so, that a person would. So I have a question and just so everyone knows, we prepped a little, but I'm throwing a zinger in at you. What's your okay. take on calories? I, I believe calories of 20th century, but you know, there are people who are very like stuck on calories, but like a hundred calories of broccoli is not a hundred calories of M&Ms, but what's Amen. your, yeah. Like what's your take on all that? Girl, that's a great question. I, people always ask me when I give them recipes or when I talk to them, I say, how many calories? I say, I don't know. I don't count calories. Um, like, because like you say, I don't think calories are our most valuable, a valuatory tool to determine is this a food that serves and supports me? Because like I say, you can have a hundred, they have a million of those now, um, hundred calorie snack, yeah. you know, of any, anything you want, <laughs> you can find it in a hundred calories. Like as if a hundred calories is this like magic number of calories right. you can, you know, have, well, what is that about? Um, I do not care about calories. I care about color. I care about eating more plants. I care about, um, proportions, but I really don't count calories. In fact, I discourage counting calories. I'd rather you count colors and calories. How many colors are on my plate today? Do I have oh, red? Explain Do I have that. green? Can, yeah. explain, explain, it. The, explain the color because some people won't understand what you're talking about. Yeah. So um, the way I like to think about it is 
Mother Nature, I think, was very wise and color coordinated our food. Mm -hmm. And I like for us to think about it like fashion, which is kind of funny because I'm not a fashionista myself. But when we think about putting clothes together, we think about color, we think about texture, we think, does it fit our body, right? Um, but specifically talking about colors, Mother Nature has created food in such a way that it's beautiful with all these different colors that entice our visual, our, our eyes. And then she's put different types of nutrients in different types of colors. Something that's red is gonna have more lycopene, something that's green is gonna have more chlorophyll, etc. So if we just follow the attraction to these beautiful, beautifully colored, whole, fresh foods, and we put them all on our plate to create a masterpiece, think of yourself as Picasso in the kitchen, putting together these colors on your plate in your meal, you can feel pretty confident that you're getting your nutrient needs met when you're creating that rainbow on your plate. Yeah, I have to say, I, uh, I've had my microbiome mapped a couple of times and I just had it done again. And oh, cool. Yeah, it's great, but I can't eat spinach and broccoli because they were being mm. in my diet. And what I'm learning from that is it's really mm -hmm. important to vary your diet and to have yes. different colors and different types of food. And I tended yes. to have my, you know, favorite five or my, you know, yes. delectable 10. Yes. And it's like, I gotta, I gotta like spread out and eat more. Yeah. You make variety. a great point. I mean, that variety is so important. And I think it, it, it speaks to the idea too of seasonality, I think, you know, yeah. because yes. so many of us have our fave five things. We eat them all year round. It's one thing to have your fave five things, spring, summer, fall, winter, <laughs> right? Never you're rotating. That. You're rotating. Oh my gosh. I had, I don't know what just happened. You're back. I That's my okay. phone on. Ah. Hold on, let me put this on, do not disturb. Although I did already. Why is it coming? Your here? phone got so excited about different colors of food. <laughs> That's my son calling me. I, don't, I have it on do not disturb. I don't know why, but he'll call my husband, hopefully instead. Uh, but yeah, you know, we have our favorite five things that we eat all the time and it's, we need to expand. You know <laughs> we what? definitely need to expand. I have never heard anyone bring that up before and I think I think you really have something there the reason seasonality one of the reasons it's so important is so you don't develop basically an allergy to the food which my stomach has because I was yes. eating too much of the same thing that is mm -hmm. like makes so mm -hmm. much sense okay and that leads right into the next question can you define mindful eating I know that like like there's some Japanese monks have talked about mindful eating and meditation mm. and how it relates mm -hmm. but how do you define mindful eating and why is it important I define mindful eating, I guess it has three parts. I, I, I would love to be able to say one thing, but I think it's three for me. Um, for me, mindful eating means being thoughtful about how your food impacts three different things. One is the earth and the environment, the water, the plants themselves, the animals themselves, you know, the choices that we make that impact our food system and our earth thinking about the food and beverage choices we make and how they impact our mind, body, spirit, gut, microbiome, and, and mood, et cetera. And then thinking about how does what we eat fuel the manifestation of our gifts? So being mindful of all of those things. So starting from what you're buying, you know, what kind of meat, how was it raised, what kind of produce? Is it local? Is it seasonal? Is it organic? Um, is it appropriate for your, well, let's stick with the environmental stuff. Um, is it local? Is it seasonal? All of that. And then after you purchase it, you're taking it home, you're thinking about, okay, um, how am I going to put this, prepare this food in such a way that it's really nourishing me on all cylinders? And then after you've eaten, really kind of assessing how do I feel now? Did that food serve me? Do I feel energized? Do I feel clear headed? Do I have the energy and clarity of thought to do the work, the good work that I have to do right now? So I would say all of those are part of mindful eating. Okay, I'm going to fess up Sunday. Please. Yes. 
I went to the farmer's market and there's this great organic bakery. So named bagel. So mm. I got a sesame bagel, right? And then I have mm-hmm. this like it's Irish. I'm sorry, everybody, but it's Kerrygold is phenomenal butter. And then I have organic cream cheese. So I had a bagel with cream cheese and butter, which mm. tastes so good. I passed out for three hours. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. It was worth it. But I'm like, yeah. oh my God, it was so obvious. Like it was so mm. obvious. See, but, now that is awesome. You were mindful. You you a made a really good choice you supported your local economy you chose probably something that i don't know maybe they had local flour in that bagel i don't it know did. it did but um, no it was not a good choice because i passed out like <laughs> well i was gonna say that you were mindful though i'm not talking about right. whether it was good right. or bad i'm saying right. you were thoughtful about the choice you were thoughtful about what occurred afterwards you were able to internalize it not internalize but um evaluate the language of your body and say, oh, I ate that, it was delicious. And that's gonna be a sometime food for me because I was in a food coma for three days. No judgment, no shame, no sadness, just I am mindful, I see what happened. Now let me take that information and move forward. Right, and that's my thing. It's like, I I knew I was gonna pass out because buttercream cheese, the carbs, it's just like, but oh. Uh, I know, I had a bagel the other day. I mean. (laughs) My neighbor brought me a bagel from New York just last week. And they I was really, like, oh. yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they they're, they're not the same anywhere else. They're really not. I definitely ate it. <laughs> okay. With so, cream cheese. Yeah. I mean, you have to. Have so, to. and I thought, oh, we should put avocado on here. No. no I had the same food. thought, actually. And then not only did I have cream cheese, but I don't have cream cheese at home. I had to go out and get it. Just so I could not put the avocado in my house on my bagel. Okay, that's I'm how with committed you. I was. <laughs> I'm, I'm so with you. Because I even thought maybe I'll put avocado and cream cheese to at least have the avocado. I'm like, no, why kill the cream cheese on the avocado at the you. next meal? Okay. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask you, this is a question I'm asking every guest on every episode. I might piece it together. I'm interested to see where the answers go. But what do you think we need to do to create a food system where everyone can eat healthy food? Yeah. I, I have a thought about it. I'm not sure how helpful it would be, but my first thought was, or is, I think we have to really educate consumers about food. Because I think if everyone really understood how powerful food is on so many levels for us personally as the people eating it, for the people growing it, for the people selling it, for the earth, if we really grasped that, like really grasped it, I just don't see how we could continue to make the kind of choices that we do that create the food systems and challenges that we have currently. So I feel like education of just the general population around these issues is really a good place to start because as people learn more they'll be up in arms more they'll want to do more they'll make better choices um and when as that happens the industry has to change as well so that's what i was thinking i think i think the do more you have a good point because one of the things i've become sensitive to um, I, I, cause I sort of, I work in different parts of the food movement and you know, Steve Ritz up in the Bronx is a really good friend, you know, and they're just, there are people in this area who just don't have access and they don't, they can't afford it. So it's not even, they, even if they're educated about it, you know, mm. they, they, they might not be able to buy it. So I'm trying to think what could, what could people do? I mean, I think it's all community based, like that's how all problems have to be solved as community up. But, but I do think you have a really good point with um, education. There still needs to be a lot more. I mean, it's, it pains me. I, I, cause when I did sustainable table years ago, that's all it was consumer education. And mm-hmm. just knowing that we still need so much, so much education. I, and I mean, oh, I yeah. include myself, I include myself. Okay. So what I love about what you're doing is you don't just have like eat seasonal exercise, sleep. One of your core values is joy and laughter. Why is yes. that important? And why do you incorporate that into your work? Oh, I think it's huge. I think so much, I feel like when we approach wellness, when we approach changing our body, changing the way we move, eat, think, just changing anything, 
I feel like our first thought is like, oh, it's going to be so hard. <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, I don't want to do it. Uh, you know, and we, we get so robotic, serious. Okay, I have to count my calories. I have to can't eat right. this. That. Who wants to do that? That is not fun. You know, I feel like fear and frustration are not good motivators. They're not sustainable ways to, to manifest change. But if we think about these changes that we're planning to make as exciting, as joyful, if we can turn around and laugh at the things we didn't even know or laugh at, you know, having cream cheese and butter on a bagel at the same time. I mean, ha ha, that's hilarious. It was delicious. I loved it. Move on. Rather than, oh my God, you won't believe what I did and I felt so bad about it. No, I'm trying to leave all that negativity at the door and just bring joy and fun and pleasure back to the conversation and food. I feel like if we're just talking about food and restaurants, you know, people are always talking about pleasure and, and, and all of that. But when it comes to being healthy and wellness, there's suddenly like all the fun comes out of the room right. and I'm right. trying to put right. it back in. Right. No, that's why I'm doing this show. I mean, you know, this is just the beginning, but I, but I want this to be a natural talk show where you laugh and it's joyful right. and there's, yeah. you know, y- you can actually get excited about the food you eat. Yes. Um, even if it's broccoli. I actually love broccoli. See? Me I'm too. But I'm so upset. Saying. I'm so upset. Again, I can't I'm so eat sorry. it. I shouldn't have used that one. No, I have a similar okay. issue though, you know, because I, my favorite fruit in the world is cherries. I yeah. ate a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton. Then I had a rash. Then I couldn't eat cherries anymore. Forever? I can eat them, but my husband gets uh, upset. My son gets upset and I get a rash. And I'm it itches. Because I found, <laughs> I found that some things, like when I first did, I couldn't have apples. I can now eat all that was I had an apple virus an apple pit mm. virus that's actually on the plant I now have a cucumber virus that's on the actual plant but it's now in my stomach mm. in my digestive oh, wow. yeah mm. and I didn't realize that people actually got them um mm. the question with joy laughter and changing ourselves mm. can you give us this is a total personal question tips okay. on how to get rid of a sugar addiction because I got one couple years Ooh. ago and it's hard like I got I was completely off sugar mm-hmm. and then when I quit drinking because you know wine it has the sugars sugar. in it people yeah. like just have sugar just have people chocolate. said that they said switch oh, yes. it for the sugar oh yeah yeah they're like have <laughs> and then so now I'm addicted were to sugar and not professionals no no they weren't <laughs> professionals they were not they were people who were not qualified to give me that advice but, so I'm, I'm addicted to sugar again. Do you have tips for someone who might want to cut back or cut out? Do you, is it best to go cold turkey? Like, how do you help someone? Well, you know, it's a very personalized answer. Because um, it really depends on how, for me, if, if you, you know, if I was working with someone who had that, it would depend on what kind of sugary things they were eating, how often, how did they feel about it? Those would be questions I would have to help them to navigate that. But um, broad stroke, I would say, one thing we can do is eat more bitter things. So there's this really fun and interesting correlation between having more bitter foods. And when I say bitter, I mean things like Um, kale, collards, escarole, bok choy, and uh, whatever, any bitter, even coffee, frankly, uh, like shade grown organic, anything of that bitter flavor, the more of that we introduce into our body and allow ourselves to actually see it. It doesn't taste it. It doesn't work when, you know, you eat something bitter and you cover it all up with sugar, obviously, right? Right. Um, Right. (laughs) You have to actually taste the bitterness on the tongue. And then it has to also do its work in in our various um, systems. But the more bitter foods we consume, the lower and fewer our sugar cravings become. So that's one thing you can do. Um, The other thing we can try when you have a sugar craving and you're thinking to yourself, oh, you know, I really want that cookie or donut or whatever your sugar thing is. First, have a glass of water before you eat it. Then you still want it. Okay, go for what? Still want it. Okay, fine. Just have a small piece of it. Um, So we have to start figuring out with the water and the walking, the goal there is to kind of reprogram your associations and your habits with, by putting something positive, something nourishing in that space. Oh, I'm thinking I want something sugary. I could go and grab that, or I could go do something that really serves me, like drink some water, go for a walk, call a friend, journal, 
anything that just takes our mind off it for a little while. Oftentimes, if we can get past that moment of desire and divert our attention, we can often move past it. And if we can't, then either go ahead and eat the thing that you want, but a small amount, or choose a better quality sweet thing. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's a tough, no, it's tough. And I've done it before. I mean, they say it's harder than heroin to get off. At I least mean, equivalent. Yeah, it yeah. might even be harder. Yeah, it's um, not easy. It's funny, the bitter foods, because after my microbiome test, like all the foods that I can eat, anything I want to, radishes, and uh, like, it's all bitter food. It's like, oh, God. Oh, really healing and bitter foods. I mean, yeah. isn't that interesting? Eh? <laughs> so speaking of bitter foods... Uh, yes. I know that you lean toward plant-based with the work that you do, I do, but you're not against, you know, people eating. No, meat. but, but with plant-based, you know, there's a huge, it's not a research, but there's, there's a huge, plant-based has become so popular. We don't call it vegetarian anymore. We call it plant-based. But what do you think right. about the processed plant-based or the, especially the impossible burger? I'm mean, using that as an example because people say it's great to have a dip, like a Dunkin' Donut. I say no, it's not because people think it's healthy and it's not healthy. What's your take on that? Um, well, two things. Number one, I just want to really emphasize that I am plant focused, but I do eat meat. And I just want to underscore that. And I usually tell people as, as a sort of disclaimer that I love bacon and I also <laughs> eat cupcakes. So just know that about me. As far as the Impossible Burgers, I'm not a fan. I personally am not a fan of any Frank, what I perceive to be Franken foods you know, things that don't just happen in naturally, <laughs> pretty much in nature. Uh, the Impossible Burger for me is so processed, so unfamiliar that I would frankly rather you just ate meat than eat that. I say the same thing, eat a pasture raised, like get good quality meat, but get I would rather you meat. eat yes. meat. And that's an important, yeah. that's an important point to make quality meat you know it's not like oh get an don't eat an impossible burger eat a fast food chain burger of some other kind that's not what i mean i mean exactly what you said choose local pastured you know ground beef or whatever you want to make your burger out of and and eat that eat a smaller portion of it serve it with some leafy greens some bitter foods eat it slowly enjoy it move on no need for the franken foods oh i'm so with you so I don't know if you can talk about it, but I heard a rumor there's a book in the works. Can you tell us anything about where it's at, when it's coming out, what it's going to be about? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I can tell you some stuff about it. It is, um, it's in progress. I don't know exactly when it'll be out, but hopefully for the end of the year. And what it's about is it's called, tentatively called um, Intentional Indulgences how to, as we talked about this earlier, it's kind of funny, how to sabotage, I mean, how to satisfy your sweet tooth without sabotaging your success. Okay, let and... me know when I can pre-order it. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, yeah, and the premise, you know, I, it's interesting how books evolve. I mean, I've never really written a book before, but um, my initial intention was just to provide some recipes that would allow people to eat the sweet things that they love, but in healthier ways. But it didn't feel like enough because I, I felt like I really wanted people to be able to use the book to help them think differently about their indulgences in general, whether it's sweet treats or glass of wine or whatever it is that's indulgent for you. But I really want to shift people away from this, these ideas of cheat days and um, guilty pleasure. I, you know, again, with the kind of joy and laughter, I guess, bringing that in, I'm trying to lay out a framework where people can think about how to enjoy the things they enjoy in a way that still aligns with their values, still supports their weight and wellness goals, still tastes great, um, and is sustainable. Now, so do you have a, a public and and recipes. Sorry, do you have an um, idea on publication date, like when it'll be out? Well, I'm still working on it. Um, it's almost done, I think. Uh, <laughs> it's almost done. Uh, but, well, it's almost ready to go to the editing stage is what I mm. mean. So I'm hoping by Christmas, oh, but good. I'll keep you posted. Do, do. Um, so I did a 
uh, one of these types of uh, shows with a doctor and a researcher. And, you know, he was talking about the best way to deal with COVID is just to try, is to try to mitigate the effects of it, which meaning build your immune system. So do you have any tips for people on what they could do to help build their immune system to try to lessen the effects of COVID if they should get it? Yeah, that is such a good point, actually. Um, and I don't know if you saw recently that report on CNN talking about the uh, correlation between being overweight and vaccines being less um, effective, particularly for COVID, but just in general. Right. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really important point because really one of the few things that we can do right now to help protect ourselves um, against or support our healing through COVID is um, really taking really good care of ourselves through our meals, our mindset, our movement. Um, so I would encourage, you know, if you've been thinking about adding more plants to your life, if you've been thinking about trying to figure out how to release some of the excess weight, if you've been thinking about how to get moving because you haven't been lately, now is definitely the time, I think, to dial into those things because even from day one, you're going to increase your immune system function simply by eating more vegetables one of the simplest ways you could do that that I often recommend is eat veggies for breakfast. Um, even if you don't change anything else <laughs> for the rest of the day, if you add a serving of vegetables for breakfast, you're already increasing the amount of vegetables you're eating every day, which is going to be a great start to a transition. So give us a vegetable or two you would throw that, in at Oh, I, I think the easiest ones are probably broccoli, spinach, and asparagus. Um, all green. I'm always... And I do want to maybe clarify vegetables, not sweet potato, corn, carrots. I mean, like green, leafy, non-starchy things like that, um, or salad. Those are all super easy to add in the morning. And even vegetables you have left over from dinner, right? Like whatever veggies you roasted or served, steamed, whatever you did with them, just put, make a little extra and serve those with whatever you're having for breakfast. And would you not think like avocado, I mean, I know it's a fruit, like fruit, uh, avocado, tomatoes are fruits, but would they be just as good? Or do you specifically think people should have a green vegetable? Um, I wouldn't call those just as good. They're healthy and they're good choices, but they're not what I mean. Um, because for me, avocado is more, I would put that in the fat category, okay. uh, not in the, you know, nutrient dense, high fiber, low carb, veggie lane. Not to say avocado is not healthy, not to say you can't add avocado to breakfast, that would be fine. But what I'm talking about is adding a serving, and by serving, I mean three quarters of a cup but about of green leafy veggies um, to your breakfast plate. That'd be one thing. That's fantastic. So is there anything else you'd like to share with our guests? Any final tips, words of wisdom? Uh, tips or words of wisdom? Hmm. Best thing to buy at the farmer's market right now? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that. Um, hmm. Well, I, I'm loving all the fresh collards <laughs> at the farmer's market right now. <laughs> They're so tender and beautiful and good, and they cook up so quick. Really? Um, I don't know if this is an appropriate thing to say, but the thing that comes to mind right now is uh, I think one of the most important things in changing our relationship with food is really learning how to cook. And I think a lot of us know how to cook, but we don't necessarily know how to cook healthily and deliciously. And so one of the things I'm really committed to doing is teaching people how to do that. And so I do offer cooking classes every Sunday at four. So I don't know if that's something to share, but I would love for people to come and join. No, please share. How can people stay in touch? How can they reach you? Are the classes free? Are they, you know? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, please. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Now's the, the time. Free. All promote right, yourself right. all right i'm out here so yes i uh, and in fact you should come even though you know how to cook but it'd be fun to have you i don't know how um, to cook oh no 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 shut the front door no i'm an advocate how yeah. can i not know this all these years you don't know yeah. how to cook girl okay that's it you're coming um but for the rest of y'all <laughs> <laughs> please come to class it's every sunday 4 p.m eastern it's the delish dish cook along it's so much fun y'all it's not it's not a demo class you know you get all the ingredients and everything and we cook together so it's so much fun because you discover that you can do it in your own kitchen with your own stuff 
and you did it. Whatever you made, you did it. Not in some fancy cooking school somewhere, just in the comfort of your own home. So you can feel really confident after you made that food. Not to mention we eat it and you have leftovers. So if you join my um, newsletter, which is on my website, ebethjohnson.com, just join that and you'll get an update uh, when that happens. It's probably the easiest way to stay in touch. And then you also have, you have a Facebook page. I do have a Facebook group. It's um, Live Deliciously or Facebook. How do you do it? Facebook dot com slash group slash <laughs> delicious living we'll put it below it's we'll so put it long below. well yeah but joining <laughs> yeah. my group uh, will be really fun lots of recipes and tips and morning inspiration and just fun and then fun food I, stuff i assume you're on instagram i am also ebeth delish life mm-hmm. ebeth delish life everyone yes. um i'm a follower i'm a fan i can't thank I... you enough no, thank you. This is so fun. Just as yes. you meant it to be. <laughs> um, okay, so Eva, thank you so much. Just hang out one second. I got to do my my little close off. So there will be information, like I said, below for how you can stay in touch with Ebeth. Um, next week, we have Wen Jae Ying from Local Roots NYC. She is uh, she has her own company. It's a CSA and home delivery service of locally grown fresh food around New York City. And she is as amazing as Ebeth. I should get the two of you together. <laughs> okay, listen, yes. thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, let's let's catch up, like. Yes, yes, yes. We have to. Yeah. It's just you need to come I, to my cooking class. I know I'm going to. I, I, really, <laughs> it's sad. I've started doing recipes because I'm like I just can't eat steam. Well, I can't eat broccoli anymore. But I'm like I'll just steam a food and enjoy it as it is. Yeah. But I need to stick a little more taste and Girl, variety in there. I, I got you. I know. Okay. 